us uh, welcome to the Lord's house on this Sunday morning, and it's good to have our visitors with us this morning, and we'd like to welcome you, and thank you for being here. Um, we uh, got a few announcements. First of all, Brother Ted, didn't know it, but he's got a birthday this week on Tuesday, and uh, so happy birthday, Brother Ted, and um, then uh, we also, uh, I wanted to thank the church for the uh, card and the generous love offering last uh, Sunday. That was a blessing, and uh, loved you and appreciate you, and glad that we're serving the Lord here, and I want to thank the Lord for the blessing of that. Um, also, on tomorrow, uh, the ladies are going to be eating at El Cactus in Fort Oglethorpe, is there at that Super Walmart Super Center in the Great Clips, that area. Uh, and it's at 5.30 p.m. And um, so, um, if you have any questions about that, see Bethany. And then, uh, coming up on November 5th, it's gonna be, that's that time change Sunday where we fall back. That's the okay one. So they need to set it back and just leave it alone, but uh, they ain't going to do that, I don't think. Uh, and that uh, same Sunday, we'll have a uh, fellowship uh, on the 4.30. Basically, if you haven't been here for that, uh, we'll, so every once in a while, we'll meet on a uh, Sunday afternoon at 4.30. We'll have a meal, have some fellowship, have a message as well, but uh, just a more of a time of fellowship that time. And then also, we have our Christmas dinner on the 10th as well. It'll be a 10th, uh, 4.30 as well on that Sunday. So I wanted to mention uh, those announcements, and um, we're going to go ahead and look at the Lord in prayer and ask His blessing on a service. Our dear Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, we are grateful for your many blessings to us, Lord. Thank you for loving us, and thank you for the great salvation we have through our Lord Jesus Christ, and that is made free to all. And thank you for paying the price for our sins, Lord, and uh, giving us eternal life through your shed blood. And Lord, I pray that you'll help us as we uplift our voices, Lord, and praise to you, because you are worthy. Lord, help us to think about your greatness, think about your goodness, think about your mercy. Help us to praise you, and Lord, help us to worship you today in spirit and truth, and I pray that you will help us to be edified and strengthened through your word today, and I pray that you will bless everything that's done. May it bring honor and glory to you. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Let's all stand, and we're going to take the church hymnal, and we're going to turn to hymn 85. We're going to sing, Bring Them In. We're going to sing all three verses, hymn 85. shepherds fall away bring them in bring them in bring them in from the fields of sin bring them in bring them in bring the wandering ones to Jesus who'll go and help this shepherd kind help him the wandering ones to find Where they'll be sheltered from the cold Bring them in, bring them in Bring them in from the fields of sin Bring them in, bring them in Bring the wandering ones to Jesus Out in the desert hear their cry Out on the mountains wild and high Tis the master speaks to thee. Go find my sheep where'er they be. Bring them in, bring them in, bring them in from the fields of sin. Bring them in, bring them in, bring the wandering ones to Jesus. Our next song is hymn 359, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. We're going to sing. All three verses of that. What a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine. Sweet to 
walk in this pilgrim way, leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how bright the path grows from day to day, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms. have our ushers come forward for our Sunday morning offering, and our missionary of the week is the Harvest Deaf Ministries, and um, I want to ask Brother Ted if you would ask God's blessing on our offering this morning, and remember the Harvest Deaf Ministry in prayer as well. Let's all stand one more time and we're going to turn to hymn 176. The old account was settled long ago. We're going to sing the first, second, and last hymn 176. There was a time on earth when in the book of heaven old account was standing for sins yet unforgiven. My name was at the top and many things below. I went unto the keeper long ago, long ago, long ago. Yes, the old account was settled long ago, and the record's clear today, for he washed my sins away. When the old account was settled long ago, the old account was large and growing every day, for I was always sinning and never tried to pay. But when I looked ahead, it's all such pain and woe. I said that I was settled. I said a long ago, long ago, long ago. Yes, the old account was settled long ago. And the record's clear today, for he washed my sins away. When the old account was settled long ago. Oh, sinner, trust the Lord. Cleanse of all your sin, for thus he hath provided for you to enter in. And then, if you should live a hundred years below, up there you'll not regret it. You said a oh, long ago, long ago, long ago. Yes, the old account was said a oh, long ago, and the record's clear today, for he washed my sins away. When the old account was said a oh, long ago, Let's shake hands and fellowship.
for the message. Uh, Bethany, around us, come with a special song. If you would, let's take our Bibles this morning. We're turning to the book of Psalms, Psalm chapter number 83, Psalm 83, and I'm grateful for Mount Calvary and um, grateful that uh, there's salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, this morning's message is not primarily a salvation message, and I will say this, I know for 100% sure that I'm on my way to heaven, and you should know too. And if you don't, don't leave the building without letting, us, letting me show you how from the Bible, because we can show you that without a question, and it's all based on what Jesus Christ did for us when he died with burying words again the third day, according to the scriptures, and uh, it's all through him. He's the Savior. Now, um, as, unless you've been living under a rock, uh, <laughs> you know there's uh, current, some current events going on in the world, and uh, what we're going to do is uh, take this one particular passage of scripture that's uh, a famous one, but kind of put things in perspective. Um, anytime there's something happening in the world, there's somebody out there that's going to try to apply it and make it... Uh, the tribulation period or the or battle of Armageddon or something like that, okay? And now there's certainly some precursors for it, and you see that throughout the scriptures uh, and uh, history, but uh, there's some specific events that we know about that's going to happen, but uh, we could place them as well. Um, there's some people that, as far as prophetically, now if you've been here, going here regularly, you already know, um, especially on Wednesday nights, 
that whole section in the 40s where God's talking about himself, he lets you know he's God by prophecy. So from the very beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, God gives you prophecy. And not just about the first coming, but about the second coming. And uh, there's like uh, 800 or something different subjects he gives you a specific uh, prophecy about. And so the, the Bible is a prophetic book, and the Psalms is full of it. You've got more on prophecy in Psalms than you do in the book of Revelation. Okay? It's, it's a lot. Uh, it's all through there. When you see the Lord reigneth, and he's reigning in Jerusalem, and the meek are uplifted, and the wicked are cut down, you know when that is. That's not right now. <laughs> the wicked are not being cut down, and the meek certainly aren't being lifted up in the poor, are they? Okay, so you know what time period you're in, and you know what it's talking about, and that's, there's some awesome uh, passages in Psalms, but also some imagery here, and you'll learn a, quite a bit from this passage. Now, some prophecy teachers don't know there's anything more in the Bible than the Daniel, Revelation, Ezekiel 38, 39, and Psalm 83. And Psalm 83, they, they, because it mentions some of the individuals as active at this time, because right now, over in the land of Israel, there's war going on if you didn't know <laughs> uh, and uh, people are concerned about it and these kind of things um, and we'll give you some information on this as we go along but what we want to do is see what God says and where he puts things and the emphasis that God puts on it because basically with anything or any topic what well, the first thing I want to know is what's God's position on it <laughs> you know what I mean uh, because listen I grew up in America so I might have an American perspective but I don't want necessarily American perspective I want God's perspective on me, on myself, on my country, on my world. I want to know what he says about it. And I will say this as well. I got saved when I was five years old. And uh, kids can get a lot more than what you think they can. Uh, and uh, it's a matter of belief in the heart. But some of this stuff, I've been studying the Bible since I was a kid. And I'm still learning in the Bible. The Bible is so deep, and God's Word is so... <laughs> interconnected that it, you, you can never ever get it all because you're not God but you do marvel at it and marvel at the uh, mind of God and the wisdom of God as how he put things together and how he's told you things and painted a picture and basically if you think about it um, I remember going up on um, top of Lookout Mountain and they had that uh, they have this mural painted in that wall there at that point peak or whatever they call that thing you know what I'm talking about they got this big mural of the Civil War painted it's really big well, prophetically, God's given you a really big picture, and there's a lot of details in it. But certain things belong in certain spots, right? And if you know where something's at, you can kind of place things. And prophetically, the more you know, the more you're able to tell where you're at. Because obviously, you got what was a mystery for certain until uh, the New Testament was the church. The church age was certainly a mystery. They didn't get that at all. They didn't see the gap between the, uh, when you see the prophets were prophesying about Christ, there's like, no gap between the first coming and the second coming. They'll jump back and forth. And um, I can show you tons of references like that, but it's the same Lord. But there's that gap, of course. And after the church is raptured out, who does God deal with principally then? Israel, right? Now, if they're still in rebellion during the tribulation period, but he starts dealing with Israel. God's timeline in Daniel's 70th week deals with thy people, Daniel's people, the children of Israel. So, What's that last week picks back up, and that week is seven years in that thing. Uh, you got seven years of tribulation period, and the, three, the last three and a half years are the great tribulation period, and that's where the man of sin kind of takes the mask off, and it's, it's, it's the son of perdition, and it's a, a wild thing going on there. Um, and then, of course, Jesus Christ comes back to this earth to establish his kingdom for a thousand years. So the, the amount of material prophetically that's in the Bible, and you'll see how it's woven, because in this chapter, he's going to tell you it's like this and he points to judges chapter four and five it's like this he's pointed judges six seven and eight oh he's telling there's something in there we can learn from that back then and it, it, it should be a, a should, shouldn't be something shocking look when you're reading in the book of genesis and you come along to abraham isaac jacob and jacob has a son his, his son whom he loved named joseph can you see some similarities between joseph and jesus christ he was hated of his brethren, right? He was sold for 20 pieces of silver because he was young. That's the price of a slave. And if he'd been older, but 30, okay? He was sold for the price of a slave. He, he was, uh, as far as his dad was told, he was dead, right? 
I come to find out, Jacob finds out he's not only alive, but he's Lord of all. You know, <laughs> okay. there's there's a, definitely a picture. There's more similarities between the life of Joseph than any other Bible any other Bible figure uh, with the life of Jesus Christ. You can see those things and see how they relate and see how they. But throughout the scriptures, you have things prophetically to give you pictures of things to come. And uh, during Sunday school this morning, we went ahead and, and emphasized a, a couple. If you weren't here for that, you kind of uh, missed it. But we showed you uh, two prominent individuals from which their descendants are front and center today as far as in the world uh, and uh, as far as what's happening. Uh, and I'll just mention them just in a mention. Okay, first of all, there was most prominent here in this passage, because it starts with them, is Edom. Edom is Esau, and there's, if you don't have to figure it out because the Bible tells you Esau is Edom. <laughs> okay, so uh, we show you those verses. The Edomites are, we trace their lineage through, through time period and brought you up to the modern day Palestinian. Okay, so they're there in the, in the scripture, they're there prophetically, they're front and center, uh, and a lot of problems from them, and they were involved, and we showed this, uh, World War II, and those kind of things. Um, then also the second individual was, before Esau came along, was Ishmael, who was a product of Abraham, and of course them helping out God with Hagar and produce Ishmael, who would be a wild man in his hand against every man in his hand against him. Uh, and they, his descendants settled in Saudi Arabia, and that's where you have uh, Mohammed and Islam and what they call the religion of peace. All 19 hijackers on 9-11 were all from Saudi Arabia. Okay, that, that, that lineage, uh, Osama bin Laden, was from Saudi Arabia. Um, and uh, so those guys get together, and we showed that in Sunday school as well. Uh, matter of fact, pictures with a prominent uh, uh, Edomite there helping Hitler with them and video as well. Now... Uh, in this passage, we're going we're to show you, we're, we're, so we know when this passage actually relates to. There's also something else we're going to need to get. Um, and we're not just doing this because it's just a current event, but there's some things that are very prominent, and I mentioned this, but I need to mention it again. There is a huge movement underfoot, and it, of course, would fall right in, in the line prophetically, but it's called anti-Zionism. Okay, and what is Zionism? Primarily, what Zionism? What they're, what they're getting at is the Jews. If if you're not a Zionist, if you're an anti-Zionist, that means that you are against the Jews being in the Promised Land. Okay. Um, are there? Let's put it this way. Every mainline denomination. Okay. Is historically a millennial. They're not looking for Christ to come back. They think the church has replaced Israel. So they are mostly anti-Semitic and anti-Zionist. They do not think Israel should be back over there. See, I don't believe it. Look it up. <laughs> you know how to read? <laughs> read. Okay. Um, so, but it is getting more and more popularity, and you get some nonsense today like um, being anti-Zionist is not the same thing as being anti-Semitic. Uh, well, we'll see what God says about it, <laughs> and if you know what God says about it, that ought to settle it for you, and, but you need to know where it's at, and Psalm 83, you'll hear it mentioned, anytime there's prophecy going on, they'll mention Psalm 83, so it's easy to remember, oh, Psalm 83, and you can see right in here what God's position is on it, and you'll know, and you'll, you'll have things down, and, and it'll be uh, something you can go back and lean on, so we're going to read this passage of scripture here, we'll start off, um, you know what? I do not want to hurry through this, and I'm not sure I'm going to get through it this morning. I might go to tonight, but that's all right. Um, I, I'm going to read this passage. I'm going to pray. I'm going to say a uh, uh, few verses there in introduction, and then we'll get right into the passage. But uh, we're going to read the whole thing. It's a psalm or psalm of Asaph. And if you're not familiar with this, over in 1 Chronicles 25, those first seven verses, it tells you that Asaph and those guys that wrote the psalms, it tells you directly they were to prophesy. So it's not, it's not a question. The Bible tells you that clearly. Now, this is verse number one. Keep not thou silent, O God. Hold not thy peace, and be not still, O God. For lo, thine enemies make a tumult, and they that hate thee have lifted up the head. They have taken crafty counsel against thy people and consulted against thy hidden ones. They have said, Come, let us cut them off from being a nation that the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance. For they have consulted together with one consent. 
They are confederate against thee, the tabernacles of Edom, and the Ishmaelites of Moab, and the Hagarenes, Gebel, and Ammon, and Amalek, the Philistines with the inhabitants of Tyre, Aser also is joined with them. They have hoped the children of Lot, Selah. Do unto them as unto the Midianites, as to Sisera, as to Jabin, at the brook Kison, which perished at Endor. They became as dung for the earth. Make their nobles like Oreb and like Zeb, yea, all their princes like Zeba and Zalmana, who said, let us take to ourselves the houses of God in possession. O oh my God, make them like a wheel, as the stubble before the wind, as the fire burneth a wood, and as the flame setteth the mountains on fire. So persecute them with thy tempest, and make them afraid with thy storm. Fill their faces with shame, that they may seek thy name, O Lord." Let them be confounded and troubled forever, yea, let them be put to shame and perish, that men may know that thou, whose name alone is Jehovah, art most high over all the earth. Let us pray. Lord, pray that you'll bless us and give us wisdom and spiritual understanding this morning in your word. Pray that your word also accomplish a practical purpose in our life as well, uh, for which you've given it, and we'll give you the praise for what you do. For us in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now, I want to point this out uh, from Matthew just to give you uh, some practical setting here. Um, Matthew 24, we need to really go through at some point as well because it is preached a lot and uh, people misapply it as well. Uh, let me just give you a hint. And one of the keys to your Bible is uh, over there in Colossians chapter number 2. And uh, let me go ahead and turn there. Put your, hold your place right there in Psalm 83. This is not going to be on the screen. Go ahead and turn there. Turn to, to Colossians chapter number 2. Okay, you need to remember this verse. And it only helps you when you're talking to the Adventist, which there are plenty of those in this area. Um, but it also helps you know where things belong and when. Okay, this chapter 2 is dynamite. I mean, the whole chapter is incredible. But we're going to point out something very specific here uh, for our purpose this morning. Colossians chapter number 2 and verse number 16. Colossians 2 verse 16. And you should know these references. Colossians 2, 16 and 17, you need to know what it's at or what it says. Okay, here it is. Let no man therefore judge you in meat. Now, we know that in the last day some should depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctors of devils, commanding to abstain from meat. Are there people that do that? Uh, yeah. <laughs> and we know who they are and what, they, what they're, they're wrong. Look, commanding ju judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days. Jesus said the Sabbath is Sunday or Saturday. Uh, well, let no man judge you in regards to Sabbath days. Why? That's a Jewish thing. That's the thing between him and Israel, Ezekiel chapter number 20, Nehemiah chapter number 9, which are a shadow of things to come. But the body is of Christ. Right now you have the body of Christ, right? You have the church. And when God starts dealing with Israel, then the, then the Sabbath day is important again. And you'll see that in, in, in Matthew 24 because he starts talking about, uh, pray that your flight be not on the Sabbath day. So when somebody starts forcing you into a Jewish time period, in the body of Christ, there's no Jew or Gentile. You're one body in Christ, right? So when they're forcing you into a Jewish time period where God's just dealing with the Jews and Gentiles separately, you know you're not in the church age. Now, Matthew chapter 24 and verse number 7, verse 4 through 7. Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. He warns them over and over again about the, the religious, the, the spiritual deception of the day. And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. Uh, have we heard of wars and rumors of wars? Yeah. Uh, see that you be not troubled. Hold it. Now, practically, it's not supposed to bother you. Are people bothered by it? Oh, we got a carrier over there. There's another one carrier. Well, they might be replacing that carrier, but who knows? But regardless, um, there's so much to cover. And I've preached the word here, but I'm just telling you. I'll mention it again. It's not America's job to protect Israel. And self defense is self defense. A lot of things that we do, we shouldn't do. I'm just going to tell you. Hagar helped out God and Abraham, right? That didn't turn out too good. You don't need to help God out. Okay? 
Uh, Israel's in disobedience. And if God says Nebuchadnezzar in there to take the land like he did, then it ain't your business to try to stop him because you're not. <laughs> uh, that's, there's a lot to say because the, in our, our time period, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Okay? I'm just telling you. You need to have your head on straight when you're, you're looking at these things. But the fact is, people are upset about it and things are going on. Listen. I thought about this because I heard about the carriers coming, and I know that Russia's moving things and all this stuff. There's a lot of military activity, and there's wars and rivers of wars. You know what would upset an American? I know because I'm American, right? <laughs> I know what was it. If they sunk a carrier, whoo man, that, that would just, man. But what does Jesus say about all these wars and rivers of war? Let not your heart be troubled, doesn't he? Okay? Let not your heart be troubled. That's not what you're supposed to be looking for. First of all, as a Christian, I'm not, I'm not even going to be in the tribulation period. I'm supposed to be looking for the rapture, looking for that blessed hope and that glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, right? That's what I'm supposed to be looking for. And then also, I'm supposed to know that God's just going to rip things up. Yeah, the, the devil's going to have his little heyday, but God's going to stomp his little head, right? So it's, it's going to be taken care of. So I'm not supposed to worry about that. I'm not supposed to be troubled about it. I'm supposed to be busy about what God's given me, uh, busy about the Great Commission. But... He says, let your heart be true, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. So these are just the things warming up, okay? For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there should be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in, in diverse places. So all those things are just warming up for the, for the show. And uh, so that's just a reminder here, don't be troubled by these things. Now we'll come to our passage here, and we'll see, first of all, there's the plea. He tells us to keep, keep not thou silence, O God, hold not thy peace, and be not still, O God. So it's a time for God to take action. For lo, thine enemies. Okay. Now, we, we pointed out in the title of this, if you haven't noticed, uh, and I'm just going to, point, to make a point of this right now. If you notice verse number four, they said, they, they, have, they have said, the enemy, come, let us cut them off from being a nation. Okay. Was Israel a nation for years? Like 2,000 years or more? <laughs> they weren't a nation. So how are they going to say, let us cut them off from being a nation when there was no nation? God knew there were going to be a nation again, didn't he? And at this point, they haven't been attacked yet, much less God setting up his reign, so they're a nation. Who said they were going to be a nation? God did. Ah, ah. So is, for God, is God the one that helped get them back in the land? Yeah. <laughs> and you better not mess with them trying to get them out either. You don't have to mess with the whole situation, okay? Uh, God's got it taken care of, but they are in there because uh, God put them there, but also... There's something else we see for this, and we'll see this, but he says, Lo, thine enemies make a tumult, verse number two, and they that hate thee have lifted up the head. So the plea is for God to do something because his enemies are doing something. Now, here's some advice, some good advice. As a matter of fact, you probably see it on the same page there in your Bible, depending on how your Bible's laid out. Uh, chapter 81, verse 15, the haters of the Lord should have submitted themselves unto him, but their time should have endured forever. Okay, you know what the enemy should, of the Lord should do? They should submit to him, right? <laughs> Listen, if I was a, a, a descendant of, of Ishmael or a descendant of Esau or one of these people group that God's called out, matter of fact, we read in Sunday school, how, what percentage of the children of Esau will be eliminated at the second coming? All of them, 100%. So you know what I would do if I was an Edomite? I'd get saved. And then I wouldn't be in, a, I'd be in the body of Christ and I wouldn't be Jew or Gentile. <laughs> I'd be safe. Simple, right? You know what those people need over there? They need to get saved. And if they don't, they're going to get it. They're going to get it. And you know what the Jews need? They need to get saved too. So we're for everybody getting saved, but these are the enemies, but the enemies of the Lord should submit themselves to him. Now, it's interesting because the people of God's enemies, our enemies, are God's enemies. And there's an association between us and God. And if you recall, Saul, before he was saved, was persecuting the church. And Jesus met him on that road, road to Damascus. You have these, these words recorded three different times in Acts. Acts uh, 22 is the middle one. Tw Acts 22, verses 6 to 8. And it came to pass that as I made my journey, and as I was come nigh unto Damascus about noon, suddenly there shone a light from heaven, a great light round about me. Now, I want you to think about something. When the sun's up at noon, that's pretty bright. Something's out shining the sun. <laughs> and it blinds you. That's bright. And I fell to the ground, and I heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? You see that? He didn't say, why are you persecuting my people or my church? Why are you persecuting me? You see that? So, 
my enemies are God's enemies. And God looks at it, he takes it personal. And I fell to the ground and I heard the, uh, went and heard a voice saying to me, saw off, what persecutest thou me? And, he said, and I answered and said, who art thou, Lord? And of course, I'm sure all the blood drained right out of his face as soon as he heard this. And he said unto me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom thou persecutest. <laughs> and he did the right thing, he got saved. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> uh, when you, God confronts you, you need, to, you need to submit. And you need to, get, you need to go with him, of course, to receive him. Now, this is... Um, Verses 3 through 5, it talks about their motive. And it's funny because God, throughout Scripture, God's always telling the enemy, here's what you're going to say, here's what you're thinking. Because God knows what you're thinking. Think about that. This morning, does God know what you're thinking? Sure he does. He does. He knows what's in your heart. He does. And that can be kind of scary because the heart is deceitful of all things. <laughs> you can deceive yourself. You can't deceive God. He knows what's going on. Well, he sees it. He knows what they're doing. Now, here is... An, uh, if you were in Sunday school, you ought to be able to pick this up real quick. You ought to know exactly when this happens. Look at verse 3. Look at it. They have taken crafty counsel against thy people and have consulted against thy what? Hidden ones. Hidden ones. Are the children of Israel hidden right now? Are they? I know where they're at. You go over there. <laughs> you, can see, you can see them. They're not hidden right now. When are they going to be hidden? Huh? In the tribulation period. And when is that? What part of the tribulation period? We ought to know this. Okay? And we ought to know where they're going to be hidden at too. <laughs> you ought to know these, 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 are, these are things. And we give you a little bit more things in prep this morning in Sunday school. But still, you'll get, it, you'll get it here. Now look. We're going back to Matthew 24 to get you this time period. When they're going to be hidden. When they're going to hide. Uh, Matthew 24, verses 15 through 22. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them which are in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down uh, to take anything out of his house. Now, hold on a second. Go back 2,000 years as Jesus speaking of this. How can somebody on the housetop know what's, how could they see the abomination of desolation? They can now, can't they? They can see it on the rooftop or wherever they're at. When you see it, you go, oh, oh, I know what that is. <laughs> Something's wrong. <laughs> uh, the Jews know about Daniel. <laughs> okay? It says, uh, and then it says, uh, and uh, let him that is in the field, not ret uh, field, let, it says, neither let him that is in the field return to take his clothes. In other words, just get out of there and go get a change of clothes. Don't do nothing. Just leave. Run. For woe, and woe to them that are with child, and then they get stuck in those days. It's a warning to those because it's going to be hard to travel with a child at that time. But pray that your flight, and that's an interesting choice of words, your flight be not in the winter. Why? It's hard to travel. Neither on the Sabbath day. Now, if it's a church age, it wouldn't matter if it's Sabbath day or not. We don't care about Saturday. <laughs> and I showed you the verse. I'm just telling you, it doesn't matter. It does if you're a Jew in the tribulation period. For then shall be great tribulation. Okay, we know where we're at. We're the last three and a half years. That's the start of it. Such is not been since the world, the beginning of the world, to this time, no, nor sh ever shall be. And except those days shall be shortened, there shall no what? Flesh be saved. So in that passage, we're talking about during to the end to be saved. It's talking about alive at the coming of the Lord, not uh, your soul. Okay, There's a difference between your body and your soul. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. And regarding elect, your elect, when you choose, you put your name you, in, in the new testament sense you're you, when you choose christ you're elect because you're in him that's what it says in Ephesians chapter number one all of israel was elect but just because they were elect you know what you got some people that were in an elect nation that they went to hell didn't they sure so don't get messed up with that 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 nonsense from calvin now here's uh so there's told to flee immediately drop what you're doing and flee now you get to revelation chapter number 12 and it says and the woman fled into the wilderness where into the wilderness, where she hath a place prepared of God that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. And you don't have to worry, wonder about how long the, the, uh, the second half of the tribulation period of the Bible tells you in days, it tells you in months, it tells you in years. All three. Suppose it out for you in black and white. Okay? So that's, that's three and a half years. So they're going to be fed of God. And we showed you verses before. How is he going to feed them? Micah chapter 7, verses 14 and 15. Like he did in days old, he's going to feed them with manna. Okay, and so they got a place in Petra, also known by what name? 
If you're in Sunday school, Petra is also known by a name called, what's the last word there in verse number eight in our chapter? Selah. Selah. We showed you the verses, Sunday school went through the verses, shows you Selah is a place. It's an Edom, south of the Dead Sea. It's a rock city, okay? And uh, we mentioned this verse too. Um, this is um, Isaiah chapter number 16, of verse 5. Send ye the lamb to the ruler of the land from Selah. And it's spelled two occasions without an H and the rest of the occasions with an H. Okay? Uh, to the wilderness. So it's not just a musical connotation. It's a literal place. And if you want to see the rest of the references, I'll give to you after church and uh, show you uh, historically where that's at. And uh, you, or where you can do a search uh, of those places. And um, I'll just go and mention this. This is a little bonus. I got it noted for the mention of verse number uh, 8. But the word Selah in its different forms. If you do a search for Selah with an H or the uh, sila, we showed you one word that had another word tacked onto it. It occurs 77 times in your Bible. Of course, you've seen numbers in the Bible, seven is completion, but that thinks throughout the, the Bible. And that sila occurs in, in uh, Haggai 3 in, in the book of Psalms as a musical, musical connotation, but also something that lets you know it's something related to the second advents in the passage, the man of sin, the tribulation period, the, the, the Lord's return. And uh, so Selah, he's going to return to that land, that's where they're going to be hidden, uh, to the wilderness, uh, to the mount of the daughter of Zion. And uh, Riley, before we get there, go and add verse 5 onto that, that passage. It may re restructure it, but it'll be all right. Okay. Huh? Okay, thank you. All right. And, um, and it says, For it shall be that uh, as a wandering bird cast out of the nest, so the daughters of Moab shall be at the fords of Arnon, Come on. There we go. Take counsel, execute judgment, make thy shadow as, as the high in the midst of the noonday, hide the outcast. There's these people that are wandering and they're trying to get to a location. They're going to pass Moab's in South Jordan. They're going to have to pass through there to get down to, to uh, Selah, to Petra. Bewray them not that wandereth. In other words, don't, don't give them up. Let mine outcast dwell with thee, Moab. Be thou a covert for them from the face of the spoiler, for the extortioner is at an end. The spoiler ceaseth, the oppressors are consumed out of the land, and in mercy shall the throne be established, and he shall sit upon it. Who's that? Verse number one, the lamb. Okay, shall sit upon it in truth in the tabernacle of David, judging and seeking judgment and hastening righteousness. So they're going to flee to that land. So when you see this hidden once, you automatically know, no, this is not happening at before the tribulation period or at the beginning, it's happening in the second half, matter of fact, toward the end, and you'll see that, okay? So you know where you're at, and that's, that's not complicated, it's just right there and just thinking about what you're reading and looking at it, okay, and just, and just studying it, okay? Now, verse number four uh, of our chapter, Psalm 83, verse uh, four, and they said, come and let us cut them off from being a nation that the name of Israel be no more in remembrance. So there they are, they have this, uh, this hatred they want to get rid of, Israel, and they want to, um, I don't want to go to verse uh, Ezekiel 35, verse 11. Therefore, as I live, saith the Lord, I will even do according to my anger and according t uh, to thine envy, which thou, used, uh, which thou hast used out of hatred against them, and I will make myself known among them when I have judged thee. And he's calling out judgment for those that are coming against the people of God and Israel in particular. Uh, so the, it's in the heart of these people to come against Israel to cut them off from being a nation, which they are right now. Um, and so we know that God is uh, somebody who's going to come to their rescue, and God is somebody who's for them being a nation. Now, verses 5 through 8 gives you the identity of these individuals, uh, some of these. And it's interesting because, uh, just, let's remind ourselves, in the book of Revelation, you're told how many kings rise to power with the Antichrist. Ten, ten particular kings. Remember the ten toes from Daniel's image? And if you actually number those uh, people groups right there, okay, the children of, of uh, at the very end, that children of um, Lot are mentioned for you. They're mentioned by name, Moab and Ammon in the list. But there's ten names there. That's just interesting. Okay. Now, the tabernacles of Edom, that's Esau, and the Ishmaelites. It's interesting. It starts with those. Those are the two we just mentioned earlier. Okay. So, um, we have Edom and Ishmael. Uh, are mentioned in this, this passage, and they consulted against him to, to, and against thee. So verse number five, I'm sorry. For they have consulted together against, with one consent, they are confederate against thee. 
Okay, so they, they're consulted together, they come together, and really, what's the world want to do? They want us to all come together as one people. And they think the only way to do that is to eliminate all differences. There's no difference between man and woman. Uh, yes, there is. <laughs> there's no difference between this, this, that, they're trying to ignore all differences. Uh, of course, try that at a tropic, traffic light, you know, there's no difference between red and green. <laughs> Plow right through there. Uh, there's some differences, okay? There's a difference between saved and lost, okay? There's some differences. And you're either part of the church or you're a Jew or Gentile. There's, there's a difference between those things as well. Um, but they're trying to come together, and they're going to come together. They have to consult together with one consent, and they're confederate against thee. So the kingdom has come. They've all joined together. They're all in unity, and they're all in agreement. Isn't that wonderful? Well, they did that in Genesis chapter 11, right? They're going to all come together and make this tower and reach into heaven. And God said, no, you're not. <laughs> no, you're not. Uh, so they're coming together, but the problem is they're coming together against the Lord. Okay? And guess who's going to do this? Not just these people. We know this is prophetically that all nations are going to do this. Okay? And this is Psalm chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. That's, that Psalm 2 is dynamite. It says, Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? They're imagining something that's empty. It's not going to happen. The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. <laughs> who's, that, who's anointed? It's the Lord Jesus Christ. Matter of fact, in that same passage, you better kiss the son, capital S. <laughs> we know who he's talking about. Thou art my son this day if I have begotten. He's in the same passage, okay? Uh, so they're taking counsel together. They're against the Lord, uh, not just against his people. They're against the Lord. Uh, they got their own God, and uh, they're going to try to serve him. Now, God's going to let them get together. He's going to bring them together. This is Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 8, and the number of verses that God condi condemns the United Nations, the nations united against them, is, is, is tremendous. But this is Zephaniah 3, 8. Therefore, wait upon me, saith the Lord, until the day that I rise up to the prey. Okay, God's going to rise up like the line of the tribe of Judah. He's got some prey. For my determination is to gather the nations that I may assemble the kingdoms. Okay, there's an assembly of the kingdoms, right? Uh, United Nations Assembly. To pour upon them mine indignation, even all my fierce anger, for all the earth shall be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. So God's going to bring them together to be destroyed, and they're going to come together against him. I guess the Lord gets anointed. So first of all, eat them. Um, and I guess give you one verse there, Genesis 36, verse 1. Now these are the generations of Esau who is Edom. And uh, we read another verse this morning talked about him being now seer as well. Um, then, of course, the Ishmaelites was in Saudi Arabia. And uh, just to give you an idea of who this was, this is uh, Genesis 16, 11, and 12. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, to Hagar, Behold, thou art with child, and shall bear a son, and shall call his name Ishmael. The angel of the Lord being Jesus Christ. And here is naming the child for he's born. His name is Ishmael, because the Lord hath heard thine affliction. And he will be a wild man, and his hand shall be against every man, and every man's hand against him, and he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. Okay? And we told you they're going to be up there in Saudi Arabia, and you had the uh, Muhammad came from that lineage, and uh, Islam, and they about bombed everybody in the world. <laughs> and uh, a pretty good, uh, accurate description there. Now, uh, also he mentions in that same verse, verse number six, uh, Moab, and uh, he's separate. He's got a separate. It's interesting. You got Ab Ammon and Moab are separate. Uh, first he lists Moab, which is one of the children of Lot. And this is from Genesis 19. What happened to Genesis 19? Well, chapter 18, Abraham says, listen, Lord, if there's, if there's 50 righteous in the city, will you spare it? Well, I'll do it for 50. 40, yeah, 30, 10, yeah, I will spare it. And he goes, well, see, there's Lot, his wife, he's got sons, and he's got two daughters at home, but he's still got daughter, married daughters and family. Oh, sure, there's 10. There won't 10, because his family was lost. And uh, his married daughters and their families died. That's sad. And until you get the New Testament, you might be wondering about Lot, but the Bible says, and just Lot vexed with, the, vexed with the filthy conversation of the, the wicked. You go, oh, he's saved. Yeah, <laughs> He was justified, but he went very just. <laughs> uh, man, he was messed up too. Listen, you're living in the day of Sodom and Gomorrah. You be careful because you can get messed up. Listen, when a dad says, don't take these two angels, here's my two daughters, you are messed up. And uh, these daughters end up getting him drunk, and that's, what, that's how you get these uh, these. Uh, uh, these, this lineage here. It says, Thus both of the daughters of Lot were with child by their father. And the, she bare the first, the, and the firstborn bare a son and called his name Moab. The same as the children of the Moabites unto this day. So there, there he is. 
And one of them means the uh, son of my father, and the son of my people is the other one, what the name means. But um, so this is the Moabites. These are in Jordan, uh, in the mid and south Jordan, uh, people groups there. And then the Hagarines is mentioned as well. The Hagarines, they say, is Iran. I am not, I can't verify that with a scripture verse. Okay, so it could be, it could not be, I don't know. Um, verse number seven, Gebel. Uh, Gebel is in North Lebanon, and uh, there's two locations. They say, well, this is actually the one that's in, down there at Edom. Well, the other reference for Gebel is actually given to you in Ezekiel 27, verse 9. And the ancients of Gebel and the wise men thereof, and the, thy caulkers, all the ships of the sea. So it's a seaport, so it is the one that's up in North Lebanon, okay? So Gebel is one of those, and Ammon. Ammon is the other son of Lot, right, his other daughter. This is uh, Genesis 19, verse 38. And the younger, she also bare a son and called his name Benami, the same as the children of Ammon unto this day. And uh, so Ammon and uh, Moab. Now, it's interesting. I want you to think about this for a second. When you read Deuteronomy, you ought to pay attention. Deuteronomy is an awesome book. But God blessed, had blessings for the children of Lot and the descendants of Edom, and he says, I'm not going to give you a foot breadth of their land. And you know how the children of Israel ended up getting it? Because they, they fought against them. They lost it. They gave it up. In other words, they were blessed because of their relationship to Abraham, being relatives of him and his descendants. And if they had done what was right, they could have been blessed too. But they didn't, and so they're going to be cut off. <laughs> and it's because of their own actions. And uh, so that's interesting. But God did set them up for success, so they, they, they turned their back on it and went, went the wrong way. Now, so you have uh, Amalek also is a descendant of Esau, uh, so a particular descendant from which you have Haman the Agagite, and um, that, that family eventually comes down to the Herod family, historically, but um, Amalek. And uh, this is Exodus chapter 17, verse 14. And the Lord said unto Moses, write a memorial in the book, rehearse it in the ears of Joshua, for I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. And uh, so that's going to happen, because he said it would be going to happen. Then the Philistines, uh, they're there in the land, uh, and uh, they were on the sea coast there where you have, matter of fact, where a lot of this trouble is happening right now, that same uh, uh, area, and these were descendants from Ham. Um, then Tyre is also mentioned here. Tyre, of course, being on the sea coast in Lebanon, um, also part of the, uh, the coalition here. Uh, verse number eight, Asher also joined with them. Asher is Syria, and so Syria is involved in the uh, battle as well. And they have hope in the children of Lot Selah. And uh, this is um, uh, one of the references I have here showing you what, what I'm talking about it being a place. This is 2 Kings chapter 14, verse 7. He slew of Edom in the valley of salt ten thousands and took Selah, see the spelling? Just like you have there in Psalms, by war and called it uh, by the name of Joktiel unto this day. And of course, uh, that's Selah, that's the rock city. Um, so uh, God has a place prepared where he's going to hide them uh, for that time. Selah, and that lets you know you're in a prophetic reference as well. Now, he's going to get into, and this is really getting into the good part of the chapter. So we just laid us some groundwork here this morning. Uh, but he's going to give you some snapshots of pictures of what the battle is going to be like and what the Lord is going to do. And he gives you those pictures there in uh, verses 9 through 12. So a, a, a picture, a type, and he lists several different things in here. Like I said, these come from Judges 4 or 5. Judges 6, 7, 8, uh, those chapters in there, and it gives you some details that are quite interesting and reveal some things about the battle and about the second coming uh, at that time, and uh, which we don't have time to get into this morning, but uh, we'll have to look at that this evening. Um, but you see these people gathering together, and they're coming together against the Lord, I guess is the Lord, against the people of God. And uh, while we're looking at this, what's the end result of this? Look at verse number 18. That men may know that thou, whose name alone is Jehovah, and guess how many times the word Jehovah in its forms occur in the Bible? It's not many, seven, seven times. That number seven, and by the way, the number system that we mentioned, some of the numbers, I guarantee you, you pull another Bible out, most of them don't have those numbers. They don't come out of seven, it comes out of something else. <laughs> it's funny, all these numbers, uh, but it says, art most high over all the earth. Matter of fact, <laughs> I don't want to mention it, but I'll go ahead and mention it. Look, we talked about most high in our study about Melchizedek. Remember in Sunday school? How many times did Melchizedek, I mean, how many times did most high, that phrase, most high, come occur in the Bible? 77 times. And who did it start with? Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the most high God. 
He brought the bread and wine, remember, and blessed Abraham. The last time it's mentioned, it's 40 times, 49 times in the Bible, 49 times, 7 times 7. The last occurrence is with Melchizedek, Hebrews chapter number 7. That's our high priest, that's Jesus Christ, because he has, uh, he has no ending or beginning. We talked about that and give you the references for that. But So it starts with the Lord Jesus Christ, and ends with him as far as the most high. But the fact is, who's going to reign on this earth? Jesus Christ is going to reign on this earth. You know what the devil's going to be done? You know what's going to happen to him? He's going to be cast where? And like a fire. And all the wicked and all the people that's got all these evil plans. And by the way, are they trying to destroy the earth? Uh, Revelation eleven eighteen. 18. Uh, yeah, they are. <laughs> yeah, they are. <laughs> okay. Are you supposed to worry about them? No. Why are you worried about man that's going to die? Yeah, but they're coming after you, so. If you're a Christian, what can they do to you? They could kill your body. What else could they do? Nothing. They might make you wish you were dead, but <laughs> they could But guess what? Even if they torture me, it's for a limited time. If I led a normal, healthy life, I'll live a certain amount of time, and that's it. And I'll be in eternity. I'm saved. I'm going to heaven forever. And you know what the devil could do about that? Nothing. Jesus is coming for his church. You know what he, the devil could do about that? Nothing. Israel's going to be in the land. And guess what the devil could do about that? Nothing. Now he's sure going to try. And Jesus Christ is coming back, and though all the nations of the earth and their armies <laughs> come against it, they're going to be defeated. And Jesus Christ will sit as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And in this very messed up world you're seeing, and it's messed up, there's going to be peace. The animals are going to be put in harmony. They won't be attacking kids. They won't, snakes won't be biting you. It's going to be a time of peace and of joy and nation, na nature rejoicing. And that could be as soon as seven years from now. If Jesus came today, the Antichrist steps up. Seven years from now, Jesus Christ will become bound and all as a boom. Setting up his kingdom, and then you can have peace. It's hard to imagine. Yeah, yeah, there's some bad things going. And yeah, Daniel got upset when he saw some of the prophecies, but you're not supposed to worry about it. God's in charge. So what does God expect me to do right now? First of all, he expects me to know what's going on because I got the book. He told me, right? I should know what's going on because I don't want to be deceived. And he also said, don't fear. So I don't need to fear it, right? Don't worry about it. What if war came here? Well, what if it did? Who's taking care of me? The Lord Jesus Christ, right? And if God don't let you get killed, guess what? You're not going to die, right? And if it got, it's your time, now, the two witnesses, they prophesy, it tells you how many days they, they prophesy for. They had a certain amount of days, and nobody can kill them during that time. Nobody. And they're there at the front of the Antichrist, and he can't do nothing about it. Now, they try, they can't kill him. If the whole world wanted you dead and God didn't, guess what? They couldn't kill you. What's your job? To preach the gospel. To show people how to get saved. In addition to that, edify the saints. Exhort one another daily what is called today. Let's any be hardened to the disciples of sin, right? What are you supposed to do? Point people, hey, you need to get right, the Lord's coming. You need to do what's right, you need to be witnessing. Because what? People get their mind on the wrong thing, get their mind on the wrong, wrong activity. And what, next thing you know, they're thinking about war, they're thinking about preparation. People have given up the rapture and started preparing for the uh, coming of the Antichrist. So they're stocking up food and stuff. I don't think there's nothing wrong with having food if you can. I mean, for an emergency. But that's not what life is about. Because that's what? It produces isolationism. God didn't put us here to be isolated, did he? He said, go into all the world and to do what? Preach the gospel to every creature. And if you're not doing that, you need to be. And so much so that we give money above our tithes to help missionaries, right? Because we want to see the gospel around the world. Because guess what? Everywhere you go, anybody you meet, they need Jesus Christ. And we're supposed to be faithful. And we're supposed to be excited because the more you know about prophecy, and we'll get this at Thanksgiving night, but the more you know about it, the more excited you are about it, and the more you look forward to it rather than, oh, this stuff scares me. Well, if it scares you, you don't know what you're, you're talking about because you, you haven't studied it enough. And to the place where you get to, you look forward to it. When you're first ready, I'll tell you how you are, because look, you're a sinner just like anybody else, right? So I've been saved. I'm a saint, right? I'm not facing wrath. I cannot perish. We identify a little bit too much with the sinners and with the devil's crowd sometimes. Hey, listen, when Jesus comes back and stomps them and rides over them and kills them with a sword and all that stuff, that's a good thing. Why? These are people that have deliberately, because after the last three and a half years, the devil shows himself. They have to worship the beast and the dragon. Listen, if you worship the devil over Jesus Christ and the lamb, they know who he is. 
They're telling cry for the locks to fall and hide them from the face of the Lamb. They know that Jesus Christ shed his blood for them, and they deliberately reject them. Guess what? They get what they have coming to them. Whosoever will, let them come. And how do they come? They come freely. It's our free gift of eternal life to anybody to receive it. And you'll be excited about the Lord coming, and you, the more you see about it, the more you know about it, the more excited about it, and you start seeing it, you start looking, you start reading your Bible. The Psalms, it just jumps off the page. That's God talking about that day again, because God's excited about it. Listen, I love it because I look back and I see the precious blood, and I think about the suffering that Christ went for me, and that's wonderful. But, yeah, it pleased the Lord to bruise them, but that's not God's big day. God's big day when Jesus gets what he deserves. And if you're saved, that'll be a big day for you. I want to see that. And when he's exalted and everybody knows it, that's him. That's the Savior. That's the creator of the ends of the earth. That's my, that's my Lord. That's a good day. That's when there's glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. And until that day, there's not going to be peace on earth. But it's, peace is available right now for your souls with Jesus Christ. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ in Romans chapter number 5, verse number 1. So we started this. I encourage you to be here this evening at 6 o'clock to get the rest of this, um, this passage. And it's something you need to know. Something you need to have down, especially in the day you're living in. There's a lot of deception. But the, the end result of this, first of all, don't fear. Second of all, are you ready? Are you saved? This morning, if Jesus came back right now, I can't ask for anybody. You could be in church your whole life. Are you 100% sure you're going with him? Do you know you're saved? If not, you need to get it settled this morning. I won't leave this building without getting, doing it. If you are saved, are you ready to meet him? Because every Christian should have the desire to hear two words. It's like when I have my steak, it, well done. <laughs> He's going to say, well done. If I hear it, well done, that good, faithful servant, that's going to be good. Are you living in a way that's pleasing the Lord? Are you a witness? If not, get right with the Lord. I mean, you've got to fall to pray. You've got burdens. Pray whatever the Holy Spirit leads you to do. But we don't have an invitation. Let's look at the Lord in prayer. Lord, I pray that you'll bless this morning. We need